here I am in the, uh, the office, what passes for an office, the nerve centre of the practice, and um, here are the staff wage sheets. Um, what they used to do was type these all in on a spreadsheet, or rather the receptionist used to type them in on a spreadsheet, and uh, then send the spreadsheet off to the practice accountant, who then used to pay the payroll, um, you know, for which they, he, he charged. Um, I've never done that. I mean, I use a program called QuickBooks, which um, calculates the, uh, the wages automatically. You just type in the hours, press the button, and it, uh, you, know, once, you know, providing you've got the tax codes and everything correct, it will um, do it all automatically. Um, QuickBooks is, you know, it, it, it does the job. It, there's not much competition in that sort of type of program. Most of these programs come out of the States. And they have the American payroll built in, and they're a bit reluctant to um, put the time and effort into sort of having a separate department that just does UK payroll because uh, UK power, you know, is incredibly complicated and it sort of doubles the work, but not, and it doesn't double the market for them. So they sort of, uh, QuickBooks begrudgingly does the UK um, payroll. And they charge a lot for it as well. I mean, they charge, I think, about £50 a month, so £600 a year, which for a software license is quite a lot. Having, having said that, it doesn't just do payroll. I mean, it, it does the whole practice. So it's, the, it runs, it's a business program, an accounting program that does the whole um, practice. So, you know, compared to what you might pay an accountant, for example, I suppose an accountant wouldn't charge you much less than £50 a month just to do your payroll. Um, and when you can do it yourself, it's really just your time. Why do it yourself? Well, um, management, monthly management accounts and control of the business, I would say, is much uh, the best reason. Um, if you send, do send your stuff off in a shoebox to the accountant every month, then uh, you're not really going to get much of an idea about how well the practice is doing until the end of the year, possibly not even until after that. Um, and uh, I like to make changes on a monthly basis. You know, I don't, I mean, in fact, even on a weekly or a daily basis. Uh, I don't like to make changes on an annual basis. I tend to find that you work too hard or you don't work too hard enough and before you realise that you've got it wrong, um, you're a year behind the curve. QuickBooks does an online product, um, which I don't recommend. What they've done is they've tried to adopt the sort of the Microsoft Adobe model of software as a service um, by putting all their stuff online. And uh, the functionality of the online product is nowhere near the functionality of the, the product that you download, the QuickBooks Pro. We have the, um, I think it's, it might be the lowest, there are four um, levels of functionality. I think we either have the lowest or the second to lowest. Basically, um, it's not multi-user, so uh, you have to, you know, only one person can use it at a time. That's what it boils down to. Funnily enough, it, it is multi-company. So... One person could use it to um, keep the books for 20 companies, which would seem to me to be far more valuable than having two people keep the books for one company. But that's what they choose to put the brake on, how many people can use the data file concurrently. Um, and um, I suppose it has some relationship to the size of the business. Um, <clears throat> so what at the moment I've got it installed on the server and I use it, but I'm thinking of um, moving it over to the reception computer so the receptionist can use it. Obviously backups are critical. It backs up uh, once every three times you use it. I recommend you set it to backup every time you use it because um, it is the sort of program where you can sort of turn it on and think, yeah, I'll, I'll make that transfer or make that payment or uh, adjust the, uh, the balance sheet or the profit and loss account in a certain way or make some changes to the ledgers and then, and then immediately the second time you use it, you realise that you shouldn't have done it. Or, or you do a payroll and you realise that the payroll's wrong because you put the 1st of February on it instead of the 31st of January so it's all been calculated incorrectly and you immediately just want to undo so, so always do back up and use the offline product not the online um, offering although, although it is cheaper but £50 a month you just have to grin and bear it it's not they're not they're not the um, you know they're a sort of company I would leave in a shop if there was a better alternative but there isn't um, so until there is so we're going to carry on using it now as far as um, spreadsheets go, now a lot of dentists use spreadsheets, and this practice used spreadsheets extensively before um, I bought it. And they were very comfortable with spreadsheets, knew how to work, how to put the data in. 
but not really, they didn't know spreadsheets, if you see what I mean. They didn't know, someone had to set the spreadsheet up for them, someone had to set up the logic, the maths, the, the, the formulas had to be, if, providing all the formulas were put in, then they were fine. And it's a good test to find out if someone really does know how to use the spreadsheet, uh, to tell them, you know, if uh, when they, they had like a, a table for every month, and um, they came up to me and said, look, it's the end of the month and we don't have a spreadsheet for next month to put the data in. So immediately I knew that really they, not, they didn't know how to use a spreadsheet, they were just acting as a data entry. Um, because anyone who knows how to use a spreadsheet should know how to clone the, the, the sheet that they're using you know, for, for another month. Uh, 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 let alone how to sort of draw totals out of them. And as soon as you start drawing totals out of a load of disparate spreadsheets, really you're just doing what QuickBooks does much, much more efficiently. Um, and the other thing is, you know, when, if a dentist joins, if they come to you and say, um, you know, the dentist has joined and so we need to have a new column. Someone's paid by, um, you know, some non-standard payment like um, a cash <laughs> check. Someone's written us a check, that happened the other day, but I don't have a column for checks. What uh, can you put in a column for me? Um, anyone who's in charge of a spreadsheet should know how to insert a column, not just insert a column, but make sure that the maths, the totaling stays consistent across and down and also know how to check that, you know, to double check, to put in a second box which uh, with a different arrangement of maths that should come to the same total so that you can cross-check that everything's working properly. And that's the difference between someone who uses a spreadsheet and somebody who knows how to use a spreadsheet. So, also there's a question of confidentiality. If you've got all of the staff giving all their hours to one member of staff, then obviously she's in a position of quite considerable um, trust. Um, not that uh, she wasn't trustworthy, it's just that uh, of all the things that staff are sensitive about, their wages are one of them. They don't really like everybody else knowing how much they earn, especially if they're not earning as much as everyone else. Um, and, uh, and also, there's a sort of an audit trail. If, someone, some, if I ask someone to fill in um, uh, a sheet like that, then it's in their writing. So there's no question that it's them that's sort of made this strategy declaration. And if I'm around in the morning and I know for a fact that, you know, they're putting down 8 o'clock, but in fact they're sort of rolling in at 5 past 8 and not really ready for work until quarter past, then they know that I'm going to see these claims. And uh, I might well say, well, you're not, you know, you're not. The way that, the way that this works is that if your hours are from 8 o'clock, then you have to be ready for work at 8 o'clock. That's not, you have to be through the door at 8 o'clock. That means you have to be through the door, jewellery off, changed, sterilised and, and ready to work, you know, at eight, so that you start being a value to the practice at 8 o'clock. Now, I know that's, you know, I think that's a bit sort of an authoritarian approach, but, um, and I don't, obviously, I don't, you know, stick to it. No, we don't have a clock. Although we have had, I have had a practice that did have a clock, where people had to clock in and out on timesheets. Um, so obviously we don't really stick to that, but I did mention it at the last staff meeting because some people were coming in early enough to be ready for work and other people weren't. And so it's like uh, you get dissent between the staff, you know? It, it's just a source of friction. Everyone likes to think there's a level playing field and that they are not coming in and ready for eight o'clock and it's not noticed that someone else is not rolling up until 8 o'clock and not ready for work until quarter past or half past. And, and the first thing that staff do like to do when they come in is have a catch up, don't they? On the spine. It's natural, isn't it? They come in, hi, how are you? Did you have a nice weekend? Before you know it, they're talking about whose births, marriages and deaths, etc. And you're sitting there thinking, okay, you know, I'm paying you 10, 15 pounds an hour, whatever. And that's three pounds that conversation just cost me. Now, you know, you shouldn't really get obsessed by thinking like that, but, you know, I think that they need to know that uh, uh, when they're working, they're working, and uh, when they're not, they're not. When you take over a practice, you inherit the staff contracts under the transfer of protected undertakings, 
um, transfers of undertakings with protects the employment, the Tupi regulations it's called. And so what happened is I've got staff on two types of contracts. One is the staff that have joined me since I bought the practice that are on new contracts and the other ones who I who came with the practice who are on the old contracts. And of course the old contracts are terrible and they, well, they're the fourth generation photocopies of BDA contracts which were you know, out of date in 1983 and um, we, in particular we had one member of staff who was paid for lunch hours and, and most of them weren't. So, I mean, how would you resolve that? Let me just ask you, let me give you a couple of seconds. Okay, you've got five members of staff, four of them are paid during their working hours but not for their lunch hour, and then one of them is paid for the working hours and for their lunch hours. So how would you reconcile that? Have a think, just think to yourself. I have a slurp of this lovely dobby. <clears throat> what happened, I mean you have to resolve it by agreement because you can't, um, uh, you can't unilaterally, or you, you, there are circumstances under which you can unilaterally make changes even in a cheaply protected employment but um, that's not really, it sort of goes beyond the scope of this, this sort of informal chat. But um, you have to resolve it really amicably by agreement if you don't want a, a morale to drop. And um, the situation with someone who's, let's say, getting paid the same, supposing that for the sake of argument they're just saying they're getting paid £100 a day. Everyone's getting paid £100 a day, but this woman was getting paid for her lunch hour. So what I did was I pointed out that she was getting paid one extra hour, but as a result her hourly rate was less. So she was getting paid the same as everyone else in, at the end of the month. But um, and she thought she was being quite clever getting paid for the lunch hour, but in fact it meant that her average hourly rate was lower than it, it would have been if she hadn't been paid for the lunch hour. And it's a bit counterintuitive, so, and I had to explain it to her two or three times, which is not a problem, but let's assume that um, one of the members of staff who's not paid for the lunch hour does an extra hour, then they'll get paid, they'll get paid more for that extra hour than the member of staff who is paid for her lunch hour because her hourly rate is less. She's paid for more hours, but her hourly rate is less, so she earns the same. So now when she does her extra hour, she's doing it for less per hour than the other staff are. So when I explain that to her, bearing in mind that uh, obviously um, she was going to get paid the same whether she was paid for her lunch hour or not, whether you know, she was paid on that basis or on the same basis as the other staff, let's put it that way, her pay, her take-home pay wouldn't change. What all that would happen is, she would um, effectively get an increase in her hourly rate if we ceased to pay her for our lunch hour. Plus, she would get more for her overtime. So, what we've done there, in a way, is sort of mathematically engineered a pay rise for her in return for her agreeing uh, that we we don't we shouldn't pay her for our lunch hour. And in actual fact she was pleased about it because I pointed out that it meant that when she did her overtime um, she would get the same as everyone else and not less. So um, now that's pretty creative isn't it and if you haven't followed that you better rewind the video. <laughs> I can't explain it any better than that but uh, that is, uh, that's how we got around that. So now um, she asked me if she could have a pay rise backdated and not be paid for all her lunch hours going back a month. But basically I said, no, you know, it was an agreement that we reached the day before yesterday and therefore it, it would only apply going forward. So, um, <clears throat> so we don't have to change all the, all the sheets and everything. But, um, yeah, and also with, um, with Tupi, I mean, you know, don't feel as though you're, you're completely hamstrung by Tupi. You are, you can walk into an industrial tribunal if you do uh, steam in and start saying, insisting that everybody sign a new contract, etc., etc., um, the, re the reason why you get into trouble is um, someone may well um, resign and say that they've been constructively dismissed. In other words, that by you know the changes that you asked them to make were if, uh, so um, intolerable that in effect you were making their job untenable, and as a result they felt compelled to resign, and, and therefore they've been effectively dismissed by back door. Um, now, I'm not an employment lawyer, I'm not even an employer, but I mean, as a dentist, we need to be aware of all these things. So, um, so that's what you mustn't do. Um, what 
most employment lawyers will tell you is that you know pretty well after three months you're pretty well bulletproof. You can start you know asking people if they agree to make changes. You still have to make changes. Again, what most people don't realise is that this the employment contract is a contract. It's, you know you pay them a certain amount of money, they agree to do a certain amount of stuff, and you can't change it unilaterally. Um, there may be clauses in there that say that you can make reasonable changes unilaterally, but, it, but uh, you, know, you are playing with fire every time you start mucking about with people's terms and conditions. Um, but um, providing what you're doing is reasonable and um, you do it by agreement, then you're unlikely, especially now that it costs money to, uh, initialize, uh, to initiate a, an employment tribunal. It used to be free of charge now, I think it's a few hundred quid which does put it out of the reach of the sort of the um, frivolous and vexatious complainants that uh, used to plague the small businesses like dentists. So, um, yeah, so to this I'm going to type these in, press the button, and uh, it's going to print out the payslips. The payslips go out by email, encrypted, and the uh, pay goes in, uh, it'll go in tomorrow. The way we work it, we pay monthly. Um, previous dentist, I think, paid four weekly, so they had 13 pay um, periods in a year. I'm um, not a big fan of that, I suppose I could make that work, you know. The reason he did it was because he had a spreadsheet and so his spreadsheets went from Monday to Friday and he didn't like it when the month didn't start on a Monday and it didn't finish on a Friday, so he basically split, he split the practice into 13 uh, four weekly instalments uh, because he could only really comfortably handle a four weekly spreadsheet. <laughs> uh, but that's fine, I mean you can, you can pay your staff every 28 days and to a certain extent it does make comparisons easier, you know, period, you know, you can compare any four week period with any other four week period. Although I don't see why necessarily, you know, I mean Christmas comes in one of those four week periods and Easter comes in one of those four week periods and to a certain extent every year, Easter might end up in a different four week period, so how do you really compare? I mean, I'm just as happy comparing months, um, you know, Christmas is always in December, so I can always compare this December with last December, etc, etc. And uh, the staff um, are okay being paid on a monthly basis. Um, again, you have to make it clear that uh, the way we work it is that um, we have to have their sheets in by the end of the month, obviously, and then we pay them on uh, the, the the sort of the, the gate comes down at the end of the month, and then they're then paid on the first working day of the next month. So um, today's the 31st. It's a Sunday. Saturday was the 30th. 29th they had their 29th they had their sheets in. 29th you get a few of the younger members of staff saying, "I've checked my bank account. I don't have any money." Um, which is fair enough. So, um, but then if the 31st was a working day, then obviously they would have had their money on the 31st. But the 31st is not a working day, so now we pay it on the on the first, the Monday the first. So they're going tomorrow. And the only other thing, obviously, with wages is in December, um, quite a few of them will want their wages before Christmas. So if you can do that and, and work on that basis, then that is always that was always a good idea. Um, what you do is you do, that does become a hostage to fortune because you know, certainly imagine someone who does need their wages um, before the 31st because they want to buy Christmas presents and things with them is not going to be someone who's tremendously wealthy and then having had their wages on for example the 21st or the 22nd of December they've then got to get through to the 31st of January which is an incredibly long month um, with no money. And of course, in January the credit card comes in, doesn't it, for Christmas and everything? So it's a you know that can it can be a problem. So I'll leave it up to you as an employer to decide whether or not you think that's a good idea. I do tend to um, pay the staff early, or the alternative is to give them like a Christmas bonus for giving the bonus early, pay them on the 31st, and then stick to the 31st of January because January is a long month. It's a long month to get through with no money with 31 days. It's, um, most dental staff probably uh, appreciate. Okay, so well, if I don't pay the wages, they're not going to get anything, are they? So um, I'm going to call that a day. By all means, if you've got any questions or queries or anything, then um, do 
email me or um, post them in the comments below. I'll be very happy to answer any um, questions you've got on uh, staffing and payroll issues related to primary dental care in the UK. Nice to see you. I'll see you soon. Bye.